Hey, I'm James hunter Ayers, and I'm going to talk today about some work I did back in 2017 with Chris Hassel at the University of Leeds, and that was looking at landscape scale evaluation of ecological connectivity. So this project really had its inception back in 2010 with the publication of the Lawton Review, which was a big study of the state of natural areas in the UK. And that came up with four main targets um, for restoring and enhancing our natural ecological networks. It can be summarised as needing more, bigger, better and joined um, habitat networks. So what that means ecologically is we needed more, higher number of habitat patches. We need those habitat patches to be bigger and to be higher quality and to be ecologically connected so that they're forming a cohesive, functioning ecological network. So off the back of the Lawton Review, there was the initiative to create nature improvement areas across England. And they were specifically designed to be delivering those objectives of more, bigger, better and joined habitat networks within their regions. Um, so there were 12 nature improvement areas created between 2012 and 2015, and they shared £7.5 million of funding. <coughs> the Humberhead Levels nature improvement area was just one of those, which you can see in the map there, and you can see where the remaining 11 are in the inset map below. So in 2015, following that initial round of funding, an evaluation report concluded that the Humberhead Levels Nature Improvement Area partnerships had maintained or improved over 13,000 hectares of existing habitat. Beyond that, they had also created over 4,000 hectares of new habitat. Um, that report also concluded that they had accrued a value of over £6 million in water resource management and carbon storage through the conservation of 1,500 hectares of calm grassland. However, that report also included consideration that they were going to need more monitoring and more evaluation to um, determine whether longer term impacts had been realised, particularly with regard to connectivity, as they, the report stated that the locally specific nature of habitat connectivity precluded a clear measure of the combined nature improvement areas contribution being established. So that's where we came in. Um, so this project was designed in order to establish that clear measure of um, connectivity for the Humberhead levels and to um, clearly show what improvements had been gained through that management. So we defined two key questions to address. Firstly, has the Humberhead levels nature improvement area landscape management actually contributed to the connectivity of wetland species? And are the benefits of any enhancement shared equally between species or are there winners and losers? Do some species benefit more than others? So the first step in going about conducting those analyses was to define six indicator species which we were going to consider for those analyses. And these are, those are the six you can see on screen now. Um, so they were azure damselflies, common dust dragonflies, waterfalls, grass snakes, willow tits and reed buntings. So obviously a variety of taxa from odonates to mammals to birds. They all have their own very specific niches and habitat requirements. Although they're all wetland species, they have their own specific requirements. Um, they have a variety of life history traits and dispersal behaviours. So we thought they were covering a really good range of a really good range of species to get a picture of what was going on in the environment. Having selected our indicator species, we next had to come up with a plan for how we were actually going to conduct that analysis. And what we came up with was a little bit of an involved process in a few stages, but I'll try my best to run through them now. Um, so first off, we had to identify the habitat networks for each species. And to do that, we employed MatSent habitat suitability models, which take species presence data with environmental data and um, look for correlations between those to define habitat structure. Next step was then to simulate dynamic meta-communities based on that spatial structure identified in MaxSent models. And to do that, we used RangeShifter, um, incorporated species-specific parameters, and ran simulations to define the baseline meta-population structure and baseline measure of connectivity. So following that, we had to incorporate the changes brought about to habitat structure for each of our species through the management of the Humberhead Levels Nature Improvement Area. Following that, we were able to rerun the range shifter simulations as a post-management scenario. Um, so at this point we had both measures of population structure and connectivity before the Humberhead Levels Nature Improvement Area was created and following all the management in that 2012-2015 period. 
So the final stage of our analysis was then to compare and contrast those two situations in order to actually get our measure of management changes. So here we're just going to go through what that process kind of looked like and give a few more details, but I'll try to skim over it quite quickly because it's all very methods. So first off, we got our species presence data, sourced out from the National Biodiversity Network Atlas between 2001 and 2016, processed those by removing any duplicate records, um, re removing any very unresolved um, records, and then spatially thinning to reduce it, the bias we saw for um, nature reserves and areas that were overly recorded and emphasized in that data set. And that resulted in the records you can see on the screen now. The next step was to source our environmental layers, which came from a variety of sources, um, from 2007 UK land cover map, from a digital elevation model, from WorldClim database, which we sourced bioclimatic layers. And beyond that, we also incorporated four linear feature layers, um, which we considered were really important for forming dispersal barriers and dispersal corridors for our six species. So as we were focusing on connectivity, we really wanted to get them included. Um, so you can see some of those layers now. We've got land cover, some of the biotomatic layers, and some of the linear feature layers down on the bottom. And what we got out of that was what you can see now. We had outputs from Raxent representing habitat suitability. From that, we were able to derive a habitat patch network through simply thresholding that continuous measure to get um, patches and matrix elements. After that, we inverted the scale on the matrix element to create a cost surface that helped indicate where animals were going to disperse throughout the landscape. <clears throat> At that point, all of the Maxent models became inputs for Range Shifter, so we combined them with species parameters that came from an, a literature search sourcing parameters of life history, population density, fecundity, mortality, and dispersal characteristics, incorporated them into Range Shifter, and we got these estimates of total population size and the total transfer of individuals between distinct habitat patches. You can see an example of that map up there now. And after all that effort, we got our baseline population sizes and connectivity. So that's our baseline measure. So next, we had to create our post-management scenario. And to do that, we got a species-specific estimate of the benefits brought about locally by the specific management efforts um, employed in the Humber Head levels. You can see those modifications in the middle. They were ranked from small, moderate to large increases in quality for each species. Then we basically just added them on to the baseline outputs and got our modified outputs. Then we were able to rerun all of the range shifter models and get our pre- and post-management results, and then compare and contrast them to uh, perform our evaluation. So you can see that on screen now for our first indicator species, for your damselflies. We've got the baseline network on the left and the changes post-management on the right. So what you can see in these maps is the circles of different sizes that are linked to the actual area of each of those individual habitat patches. And then the lines between them are the connections. Every line should be a relatively significant connection, and the thicker the line, the more connected those two patches. On the right, what you can see is the changes. So green, again, um, weight is the width of the line is indicated to the strength of that connection, but green is indicating an increase, and red would be indicating a decrease in connectivity between the baseline and the management network. <coughs> Also, you can't see it yet in this map, but some of the patches uh, will be coloured blue in future maps. That indicates that that's an unoccupied habitat patch, so it's one that's not supporting a population. <coughs> After all that, we can describe what we're actually seeing here. So you can see on the left, you've got a fairly, you've got a few clusters of connected networks, but a lot of functionally isolated modules within that habitat network for azure damselflies. And that is largely repeated, on the right, there's a very similar structure. So there's enhancement and increased strength of connectivity within several clusters, but not between them. Um, what you might also see here, if you look at the summarised numbers, is there's actually a significant decrease in our landscape summary of transfer, which doesn't seem to match up very well with all the green we're seeing in the map. <coughs> that can be explained, though, if we look in this core area, a lot of what's actually happened is the habitat extension has ended up merging a load of previously isolated habitat patches. So the connectivity that in the baseline model was 
considers landscape into patch connectivity is in the post management network internal connectivity. So that's just a little bit misleading there. So again, we see a very similar trend in when we look at common data. So they're a lot more connected across the landscape because they're stronger dispersers. But again, you see very similar structures between pre and post management, but a lot of strengthening of the connections that were already there. So look, moving on to waterfalls, you can see this is a very structured metapopulation. We've got a few isolated clusters that are all focused around a single big habitat patch with some satellite habitat patches around the sites. And there's also, in this map, you can see plenty of, un of unoccupied small areas of habitat. And then in the post-management network, again, we're seeing increases in connectivity in that core focal area, but that was connectivity that was already there, and there's no new connections made between isolated clusters. Um, very much the same with grass snakes. There's high, high levels of occupancy across the landscape and high levels of connectivity that has been strengthened through management. Now we're looking at reed bunting. So we can see in this case, actually, the majority of habitat patches are estimated to be unoccupied um, and isolated from each other. There's just clusters in the north and sort of south central portions. And again, we've got um, increases in that connectivity that's already there, but no real reconnection of those previously isolated habitats. Um, and finally, we're looking at willow tits. And this one, for this species we saw, it's the only species we saw no significant changes in connectivity between um, baseline and management networks. They're just not really affected by management. <coughs> but that can also be um, taken as a reflection of the very small area of habitat that was estimated to be created for them. Um, so they were very poorly targeted and they were very fragmented previously, so they just haven't really benefited very much at all. So summing up, uh, looking at all those maps and all those outputs, what can we conclude about the management and the connectivity in the Humbad levels? Has the management succeeded in its goal of enhancing that network and creating more connectivity? Well, in a simplistic sense, yes. We saw a lot of green in those maps. There's a lot of connectivity enhancement across the landscape, and that's variable between species, but generally large increases in movement. That's associated with increases in population size for our focal species and reduction in the interpatch distances and even the merging of some previously isolated patches. However, the reality is a little bit more complicated. As we saw, those improvements were focused on a small number of large patches in the core networks for each species. Um, there was very little focus on the peripheral network and on establishing those migration corridors and stepping stones between populations. Further to that, we saw that species weren't benefiting to the same degree. For example, the common data dragonflies, they were benefiting massively. They had a lot of increased connectivity across their network, whereas species like willow tits were not benefiting nearly as much. But that is kind of expected as they're specialist wet woodland species, and wet woodland wasn't really a target for habitat creation in this round of management. So we kind of took away that a bit more targeting for um, rare hab creating rare habitats that support specialist species and more focus on stepping stones and creating dispersal corridors would improve management in this area. So that was a brief summary of the project, hopefully brief. Um, <clears throat> now just going to wrap up with some reflections on the use of Rain Shifter for that project, which overall me and Chris were really happy with Rain Shifter main benefit we saw was that it allowed us to simulate dispersal as an emergent process that resulted from dynamic population growth and explicit dispersal and colonisation events in the landscape. As that is how connectivity arises in nature, we thought that was a really realistic um, way of measuring it and it was really cool compared with other techniques where we maybe would have had to make some more abstractions and some more simple like, assumptions. It seems really beneficial. Further to that, the flexibility of the individual elements incorporated in Range Shifter allowed us to really tailor our individual base models to each of our specific species, which was really great because we could compare these very different lifestyles um, within the same shell, within the same package, and that meant we could compare and contrast the outputs between species really effectively. Um, so that was really neat.
further to that, the volume of output and the detail of that output that we got from Rainshifter was really useful. So we also got, beyond our connectivity estimates, we got predictions of patch occupancy and the population densities in each of our habitat patches we were looking at. And you can see an example for reed bunting just on the screen now. And what that meant was that we were able to try and validate our models with, with field surveys as we had those measures of population density that were much easier to measure than connectivity. We don't have to track individuals and see where they're moving. However, those population density predictions are very tightly and mechanistically linked to our uh, predictions of connectivity. So we thought if we could prove they're accurate, then we are also gaining support for our connectivity assessment. So that's what we did. We set out to do a summer of field work and go and see and go and survey for water bottles. You can see the results of that down at the bottom. What we saw was that the dynamism and detail incorporated into the models through Rainshifter was creating much more realistic and much more supported um, predictions. They were much a much better description of what we saw on the field surface. So the non-dynamic outputs just from Maxent, without considering <coughs> Rainshifter dynamics, were not a very they were a non-significant predictor of our field surveys then occupancy predictions were a little bit better and population density was actually confirmed, was actually a significant predictor of our field results, which was really cool to see. And like I said, we took it as support for our connectivity estimates. It also supported the overall shape of the models we'd created. However, it is worth noting that it was only for one species. We only got a chance to survey for water voles. We had intended to survey more species, but British summertime contrived against us and ended up the majority of our surveys were rained off. So, that's my talk. Thanks for listening. I hope it was helpful and informative. Um, just like to say a few thank yous. Firstly to Chris Hassel, who worked on me with this at Leeds. He's a fantastic supervisor and great support throughout this work, and I couldn't have done it without him. <coughs> Following that, I'd also like to thank um, our collaborators at Yorkshire Wildlife Trust, Michael Rogers, Tim Graham, Phil Welpdale, and also Jenny Hodgson at the University of Liverpool and Simon Goodman at the University of Leeds, who assessed this work. I'd also like to shout out to Scott Forrest, who's helped me with the videography and compiling this talk, and he's been really great at that. Um, I've also left some contact and details of the publication down at the bottom. Um, so yeah, thanks again, and hope it was interesting and useful.